Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic out there. Today on the podcast, guys, we're going to be talking about crosswind landings, right? Are they a problem for pilots? How does it work? And what kind of techniques do we use? So stay tuned, you're going to love this one. Right, guys, um, in order to start talking about why crosswinds actually pose a problem for pilots, you have to understand how an aircraft flies in relation to the surrounding air and the wind around it. Okay, um, There is a difference between where the aircraft is pointing, which is its heading, and where the aircraft is actually going, which is its track. Okay, And that has to do with the wind. Now, in order to understand this, you need to picture, picture a boat. Right? Say that you want to, you're on a boat and you want to cross a river. And the river has some quite strong current in it. And you want to reach to a specific point on the other side of the river. Now, if you would sit in the boat and you would just head towards that point, the current is going to push the boat so that you end up at a, a point that is much more down river than what you were intending. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? So in order for you to actually arrive to the point you want to arrive, you need to put the boat at an angle and then drive the boat at that angle towards the stream. That way you will achieve the point that you're aiming for. Now, an an aircraft works exactly the same, but instead of a strong current, we have moderate or strong winds. So when an aircraft is flying down route, let's say that we're up at our altitude, might be 38,000 feet or something, up there there's very very strong winds okay so this means that the aircraft is almost never pointing towards the point it wants to achieve it's pointing towards the wind and the aircraft is then following a track which is that that is the line that the aircraft is actually flying so the difference is heading is where the nose is pointing and the track is where the aircraft is actually going okay so handling wise for us when we're flying um, at an altitude there's no difference, right? The only the only real effect that the wind has is that it will give us either a higher or a slower um, ground speed. So if we have tailwind, we will go quicker to where we're going. And if we have headwind, we'll go slower. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, the only time that this actually becomes a problem is during takeoff and landing, okay? Because then we the aircraft has to fly and maneuver in relation to a fixed point on the earth. And obviously the point on the earth is standing still, but the wind over that point is moving. So we are typically flying in on an uh, instrument landing system, an ILS, okay? And that is one given track that you have to follow, the localizer down towards the runway, and a glide slope that shows you how you are going to have to descend in order to arrive at your touchdown point in the correct, um, in the correct way. So, so how do we do that then? Well, think about the boat again, okay? Essentially, that is what an aircraft does. We come in on the localizer and we will be pointing the nose towards the wind in order to achieve the localizer. So we're just following that down. So you have a runway sitting like this and then you have the aircraft pointing in towards the wind. If the wind is coming from this direction, it's pointing towards that and it's following the correct track down. Okay. Now, here is where the fun begins. Okay. There are three different ways that you can land an aircraft in crosswind. You can land it either with a D-crab during flare, which is what we normally do. And I'll explain how we do that in a second. You can do it with a crab maintained during landing. So landing with a crab. Uh, this is something that we do when the, air, when the runway, for example, is slippery or wet. Or it is very wet. You know, if it's just a little bit moist or uh, damp, it's fine. We do the D-crab. And the third way is the side slip maneuver. Okay, the side slip maneuver essentially you do in order to be able to point the nose down the runway the whole time during the approach. Okay, so you might start with a crab and then somewhere at about a thousand feet or so you put a rudder into the wind, uh, sorry, in towards the runway in order to align the nose with the runway. And then since you're doing that in order to keep the track going, Because obviously if you just point in the nose towards the runway and you have a strong crosswind, the aircraft is going to move away. So in order to to keep the track, you then have to put aileron in and bank the aircraft. So you're sitting now, pointing down the runway with a bank angle, flying down the localizer. That is called a side slip. 
Okay, and the side slip maneuver is something that we do not use on large commercial aircraft. And the reason is that it's fairly hard, especially in gusty conditions, to maintain the track line. And since you're now flying with one wing low, if you get a gust during the, the landing part, during the flare, the aircraft might actually hit either the wingtip or the engine nacelle. And this is something that we obviously want to avoid. So the side slip maneuver is something that you might be doing in a small aircraft especially in a Cessna that has the wings above you, but in large commercial aircraft, we just do not do it, okay? So that brings us to how we actually during landing then. So imagine the aircraft coming in towards the runway with the crab angle that we were discussing before. The crab angle is basically the difference between your track line that you're following and the heading that the aircraft is keeping. So you're coming in with a crab like this. Okay, you're following the glide slope down, the uh, localizer, and then during the actual flare, at around 20 feet or so, then the pilot flying will push rudder in to align the aircraft with the runway. Okay, so it's initiating, it's pointing the other way, but now as you're landing, you want to align yourself to avoid a, a big movement like this during landing. So you put some rudder in, that aligns the aircraft, but obviously now you have to, since, the, since you're moving the aircraft like this, the, uh, down, sorry, the upwind wing is going to move faster than the downwind one. That will create a bit of a, of a roll moment. So you have to put a little bit of aileron in towards the, um, the wind as well. So now the last 20 feet or so, you will have a little bit of cross controls in order to keep the wings level. And then you obviously, touchdown exactly on the touchdown point and on the center line. Now, if you're coming in with really strong crosswinds, it's a good idea to be slightly on the upwind side of the, uh, the runway center line, because as you're decrabbing now, those last 20 feet, the wind will start pushing the aircraft and will start pushing it towards the downwind side. So it's a good idea to be slightly on the upwind side of the center line. So as you do this decrab maneuver, you touch down exactly where you're supposed to. Okay, so that's the that's the theory behind it. Now, the reason that this is a problem for people, especially uh, people who has low experience, is that it is a lot of movement that has to be done at the same time. You have to both decrab, put aileron in, and flare at the same time. Okay, this becomes this is something. This is a skill that you build up by being exposed to it. In the beginning, what typically happens, especially to cadets, is that they forget one of the things. So they might be really, really concentrated on putting the rudder in in order to align themselves with the center line, but then they forget to flare because they concentrate too much on that. Or the other thing is that they don't put any, um, any um, rudder in at all, and then you land, like we were saying before, with a crab angle, which is fine if the runway is slippery. Because if the runway is slippery, that is actually a good thing because you might need that slight crab angle in order to maintain directional control as you are landing. And the fact that it's slippery doesn't give you that kind of jolt that you get otherwise. But if you do this on a, gr on a uh, dry runway, then what happens is basically what you saw, if you saw that nearly viral video of the Airbus 380 that landed in strong crosswinds just a few weeks ago and got a lot of this S movement going. What essentially happened there was that they decrabbed a little bit too little. So they landed with a crab angle. And of course, the, uh, the aircraft then continued in the direction that the wheels were keeping. The um, pilots had to put a lot of rudder in to get back onto the center line. They put a little bit too much rudder in, which meant that it went on the other side. And then they had to put opposite rudder in and you get this kind of S movement going. Right, this can happen, and especially during line training and during training, it's fairly, um, it's fairly um, common to see this happening. And this is why we practice it. And it's also why we tend to have restrictions on how much crosswind a, an inexperienced first officer can have. So in my company, what we've said is that up to 500 hours, the first officers cannot land with more crosswind than 50 knots or two thirds of the limiting value if that's um, lower than that. And it can be lower because if you're landing on a runway that is very slippery, then since we have, since we get quite a lot of our directional control while we're on the ground by the friction of the tires, okay? If that friction disappears, if it's slippery, 
then we might not have enough um, control, directional control, after we've landed to maintain the center line, and the wind might start pushing us off the runway. And this is why you will see that as the uh, the uh, braking action starts decreasing, if it's flooded runway or if it's ice or slush or standing water on the runway, well then the crosswind capability disappears. Right? It goes down very, very low to almost nil when it's really slippery. Guys, I hope that uh, explanation makes sense. I hope you like these slightly more technical videos. I will do more of these handling videos coming down. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and make sure that you get the Mentor Aviation app. All right. We have a great community going inside of the app now. Just a few days ago, um, Captain Joe was visiting the app and in the chat answering questions. And I'm trying to get more interesting people coming in and, and answering questions for you. So get the app, it's completely free. And wherever you are in the world, make sure you take care, care of yourself and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.